So for this, I would like to introduce you to some interesting temples. There are lots more that are amazing, but I wanted to key on, on just a couple um, because they have very different approaches from what you're used to seeing, and they have very different approaches um, from each other. The first is the White Temple at Uruk from 3200 BC. Now, you'll see two photographs here up at the top, and they were taken 30 years apart. So you can see here and here how much erosion has happened over that time. So this temple is sort of slowly disappearing. Down at the bottom, you actually can kind of see a reconstruction of what it would look like. In fact, what you're seeing um, in these two photos is basically just the base of this temple. The actual temple above it, you, can only, you could only see the foundation of. Um. Now, the interesting thing that I would like you to think about is 3200 BC, what they've done is they have oriented this structure on the cardinal points. And we're talking more than 5,000 years ago, and they already knew what north, south, east, and west were and what that meant. That means 5,000 years ago, people could navigate, they could get around, they could go from point A to point B and not get lost. So they had some understanding of of direction and their place in the world um, enough to not coincidentally and intentionally line up a building with those cardinal points. Um, much later, uh, from 757 to 783, we have the Kailasa Temple in Ellora, India. And what's special about this is that it's a rock-cut temple. It's not really architecture. Essentially, they went over to a cliff face, as you can see kind of in the background of this first image, and they just cut down. Um, so nothing is constructed and added. Everything is cut out of the rock. Um, so all you can imagine all of the negative space would have to be removed here, right? All of this rock would have to be taken out and carried off. Um, and I think one of my professor used to jokingly say that um, the greatest natural resource in India is its people. And so all of these laborious hand-done tasks could be done because they had so many people to employ for them. Um, and this, one's, I, this one I like quite a lot because it involves integrated sculptures here with all of these elephants. Right, being symbolic of Ganesh and generally a symbol of beginning and good luck and the remover of obstacles. Um, they're not done as sculptures, they're just part of the architecture. And all of these columns, they don't necessarily support anything um, because it's all constructed from one solid piece. And there are several of these temples around India and I think it's an interesting approach and one that um, you would not normally take um, in architecture. This one's interesting. This is uh, the Kozanji Temple. Uh, and we have a monk slash architect who designed it. There is no metal involved. It's all all wood. So everything slots into each other and there are pegs. Um, and it's still standing and still preserved today. And one of the interesting things about it is not necessarily the architectural design of it, but the way that it integrates with nature. Here on the porch, you kind of look out at nature, but you kind of feel that you're a part of it because it's all, um, all of the materials came from what you're looking at outside of the temple. Then, here on the left, as you walk up to it, it's within the forest. It kind of creates these sort of um, organic curves and lines that, um, that undulate and integrate with the forest in a way that um, a lot of architecture doesn't. So you can imagine going to this temple, you would feel that the temple isn't just there. The temple is all over the world, and it's all throughout nature. In St. Peter's, you have a totally different approach. The original building um, is kind of almost impossible to see anymore. Um, there have been so many additions on it. But um, Michelangelo designed the dome of St. Peter's, and that used to be the sort of most spectacular part of it. But you can imagine being uh, 20 or 30, 40 feet up here, 
um, taking this photo up in the left, you can see the dome, but you can imagine that if you're down here in the crowd, you can't see the dome. Um, Bernini came back and designed this facade as well as what are called the arms of God. And it's this colonnade, this line of columns that goes around. And what that does is everyone that's in the crowd here is literally encircled by St. Peter's. Um, you're brought into the fold. You're, you're become a part of the community within St. Peter's. Bernini also designed uh, this bronze um, emphasis to the altar up at the front of the cathedral and um, did some sculpture work in the back as well. Um, and the thing that you feel about St. Peter's when you walk in there is height and mass. You feel the weight of the building and you feel that it's floating so far above you and it doesn't seem possible. Um, and that approach, I think, is something that's unique to St. Peter's and unique to the uh, approach that the Vatican took with their architecture. Um, with Stonehenge and the Jantar Mantar Observatory, they're built many, many, many years apart. Stonehenge, they've dated to about 3100 to 1800 BC. Um, it's actually surrounded by burial mounds. Um, and so Stonehenge is actually like the smallest part of this of this site. The site is much larger than that, in fact. Um, and it is oriented on the cardinal points, and it's oriented towards certain constellations that you can see um, when at certain solstices and, and holiday times. Um, and so you can imagine that there was some sort of function or worship going on at Stonehenge. Um, in the Jantar Mantar Observatory, essentially what you have is a telescope, basically. So you would go to any one of these um, bits of architecture, stand on a particular um, stair at a particular time of year, and look up in a direction, and that would help you observe the stars and the alignments of the constellations. You can see that um, in this top right picture that all of these stairs are at slightly different angles, um, both in terms of the elevation of the stair and they're twisted in space on the ground so they, they um, are oriented in different directions three-dimensionally so um, you'll often see the Jantar Mantar Observatory in films as an interesting example of um, architecture that is not necessarily for living but has a function um, in this case it's scientific I also wanted to talk about home architecture and that's an entirely different thing than temple architecture because you're meant to actually live in these spaces and I would like to um, compare and contrast two um, mid-century modern houses. One is the Farnsworth House in Plano, Illinois by Mies van der Rohe. Um, it was built from 1945 to 41 and Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water in Barrow, Pennsylvania built in 1935. Um, if we look at the plans of the houses, the Farnsworth house is basically just two rectangles of slightly different sizes um, overlapping and integrating with each other. The plan for falling water kind of creates rectangles that overlap and go out in uh, four different directions. Um, so, of course, the plan for 